Grace, mercy, peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. God's sure word that serves as a firm foundation for us is that gospel reading. Jesus, in the midst of his sermon on the plain, shares with his disciples, shares with, with us, how important it is for us to not worry. A cure for warts. How infected are you? This is a up-close picture of my hand. No, I'm kidding. It's not my hand. I'll tell you what, though. Google warts, and there's all sorts of nasty images that show up on your computer screen. How infected are you? I'm not talking about actual warts. If you have an issue with that, I am not the person to talk to, nor do I need to know any of that detail or information. I'm talking about being a worry wart. Officially diagnosed, certified worry warts. We all worry about all kinds of things. There are times when we worry about what we'll eat for dinner or what outfit we will wear for that certain wedding that's upcoming. The stakes are pretty low. There are also times when we worry about the well-being of our children or our aging parents or our grandchildren as they are off to college. The stakes are significantly higher then. But there are all moments where we are filled with this uneasiness, this doubt, this despair, this worry. Every single one of us. We all have them. When it comes to worry wards, we all have them. Some are out there for everybody to see, and some are hidden. We all know those people. Maybe we are those people. Maybe we're married to those people, or those people are our children, but they cannot not worry. They stress about everything. They're always anxious. There's always on edge. We all have them to some extent or another. But worry, as this old English proverb says, worry is like sitting in a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. Worry. Two weeks ago, we were able to go down and spend a few days down in Ocean City, Maryland where, as I mentioned in the blast, there's nothing better to me than just being able to sit with your toes in the sand and look out on this incredible ocean. To understand just how big and grand this world is, our God is, and just how small we are. And of course, after we spend our first couple hours on the beach, we go inside, we shower up, we get ready for dinner, and while we're doing that, we turn on the TV. And what's on TV? Shark Week. It never fails. I remember that as a kid going on vacation down to Myrtle Beach, and we'd sit there while mom and dad are unpacking, and we'd turn on the TV, and sure enough, Shark, shark Week. The sharks attacking all sorts of things, from baby seals to boats to the occasional picture of somebody showing where the shark had attacked them as well. And of course, mom and dad would say, okay, who's ready to go to the beach? How about we go to the pool? Can you imagine if that fear, if that worry of what could potentially happen to us if a shark showed up in the water really sunk root into our plants. We wouldn't have stepped foot on the beach at all. But thankfully we did, and we were there with many, many others without issue. According to a study by Psychology Today, a whopping 91% of worries are false alarms. Of the remaining 9% of worries that did come true, the outcome was much 
better than expected about one-third of the time. And for about one in four of the participants, exactly zero percent of their worries ever materialized. That is a staggering percentage. It's a small sample size, but it's a staggering percentage. A whopping 91 percent of worries were all false alarms. You've seen similar studies before that talk about the overwhelming majority of things that occupy our minds and our brains that, bur that we burden ourselves with that either never happen or they turn out far better than we could ever have anticipated. And so there's a two-sided nature to this text where Jesus says, do not be anxious about anything. Do not be anxious about what you will eat. Do not be anxious about what you will wear. Do not anx be anxious about where you will live. And the list could go on and on and on. But there's a reason Jesus says we should not be anxious. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, and what you will put on. And we can speak to the science first. There is something physically harmful and dangerous to worry. There's been countless studies that provide this sort of evidence. All of these things are symptoms or results from people who are burdened with unnecessary anxiety and worry. Weight gain, infertility, fatigue, stomach lining being eaten away, unable to sleep. These are just, well, this is a pretty all-encompassing, but probably not everything. This is the physical aspect of being anxious, of worry. But that's not exclusively what Jesus is getting at. Yes, it's not good for us physically. And Jesus wants us to be physically healthy. But there's also a spiritual side of this as well. Worry, when it consumes our thoughts and our minds, takes up place and residency in areas where it's designed only for our faith and trust. This is what the psalmist was declaring. Forget about the kingdoms and the kingdoms of this world. Forget about the one, the one who puts their faith and their hope in the Lord. It is only He who brings salvation. And so there's a spiritual side, there's a spiritual detriment brought on by worry. Walter Kelly says, worry is faith in the negative, trust in the unpleasant, assurance of disaster and belief in defeat. Worry is wasting today's time to clutter up tomorrow's opportunities with yesterday's troubles. In other words, faith and worry cannot coexist. If I'm going down a path of worry, that is, by definition, leading me away from that path where trust and faith in the Lord's providence and care for my life would bring me. If I'm tr fearful of what could happen, that I'm not fully trusting in the Lord's promise to protect me. If I'm worried about what I don't have, this. They are diametrically opposed to each other. Worry is faith in the eyes. They're constantly at odds. But see, the devil knows this. That's why he sees us as easy prey when it comes to worry and anxiety. In fact, any sermon that says, do not worry, and ends there, is really not all that helpful. Because all you will do is leave today worried about worry. Because we all do it, and we do it all the time. Even knowing the Lord is with me, even know that God is good, was I still in the back of my mind thinking when I dipped my toes into the water, what if? Of course I was. 
because that sinful part of ourselves, that tempting and coaxing of the devil to always bring that little hint of doubt and uncertainty is always there. Worry displays a lack of faith and trust in God. It ignores the promises he has made to us. It pulls us away from God as we chase after other masters and sources of comfort. This can be a very daunting thing. Psalm 33, again, read these words with me, please. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for his salvation, and by its great might it cannot rest. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in the family. And so ultimately, what do the scriptures say? It says, do not worry, do not be anxious, do not put your hope in these other things in these false gods of the world do not set your mind on worldly earthly things but what about Abraham when the Lord said I am going to bless the world through you do you think doubt and despair and worry and uncertainty did not creep into his mind of course it did Lord what are you talking about the only heir I have is my servant God says, no, I will bless you so that you cannot even number your offspring. What about all the people listed throughout Hebrews chapter 11? These were people who are commended to us because of their unwavering faith and trust in the Lord. But more importantly, what Psalm tells us is that it is the Lord's faithfulness that gives us peace. We don't put hope and trust in our faith but in God's faithfulness. That's why as we come to communion, we will be singing, Great is thy faithfulness. Because it's about the Lord's faithfulness to those who put their hope and trust in Him and in His steadfast love. And when we do that, in spite of our moments of doubt and anxiousness, God is still faithful. He still delivers. There is still grace in gospel in Jesus Christ. And so after Jesus says, do not be anxious, do not worry about any of these things, for the Father knows what you need and he will give them to you, he says, fear not. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Here Jesus is in the flesh coming to bring the kingdom and the grace and the gospel of the Father to the people. He says, even in your anxiety, even in your doubt, even in your fear, do not cling hold to that because the Lord is faithful to you. And the Lord will deliver you from all that tries to pull you away from the Father. A pastor had been on a long flight from one place to another. The first warning of the approaching problems came when the sign on the airplane flashed, fasten your seatbelts. Then after a while, a calm voice came over the speaker and said, we shall not be serving beverages at this time as we are expecting a little bit of turbulence. Please be sure your seat is fast, your seatbelt is fastened. As the pastor looked around the aircraft, it became obvious that many of the passengers and even some of the flight attendants were becoming apprehensive. Later, the voice of the captain was still ahead of us. And that's when the storm broke. The ominous cracks of thunder could be heard even above the roar of the plane's engines, a celestial ocean. One moment, the airplane was lifted up on these terrific currents of air, and the next, it dropped as if it were about to crash. The pastor confessed that he shared the discomfort and fear of all of the other passengers around him. He said, as I looked around the plane, I could see that nearly all of the passengers were upset and alarmed. Some were praying. The future seemed unpromising, to say the least. And many of us were wondering if we would make it through this storm alive. 
But then I looked over and saw a little girl. Apparently, this little girl, to this little girl, the storm within her small world was completely calm and orderly. Sometimes she would close her eyes, but then she would open them and start to read again. Then she would straighten out her legs, but worry and fear were never part of her world. When the plane was being pounded by this terrible storm, when it lurched this way and that, as it rose and fell with frightening severity, when all of the adults were scared half to death, that marvelous little girl was completely composed and never afraid. The minister could hardly believe his eyes. It was not surprising then that when the plane finally was able to reach its destination and all of the passengers were hurrying to get off, the pastor lingered a bit to speak to the little girl whom he watched for such a long time. Having com commented about the storm and how severe and dangerous it seemed and the behavior of all those on the plane, he asked this little girl why she never seemed to be afraid. The child replied, well, that's easy, because my daddy's the pilot, and I knew, I knew he was taking me home. There are many storms in life that will toss us all over the place. There are many worries and fears and concerns that will buffet us from one spot of danger to another. There are all things that can occupy our hearts and our minds. We've all known such worries, but they are like rocking in a rocking chair. It gives us something to do, but it changes nothing. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the faithfulness of your Heavenly Father. And know that He desires to give you all the good pleasures of His kingdom. And that ultimately, in Christ, He will bring you home. Let us pray. Dear God in Heaven, we thank You for being our pilot, for being the one who is in control, for being the one who is taking care of us, for being the one who watches over us and gives us everything that we need. Lord, we pray that in the midst of the trials and temptations of this world, you would give us a great faith that looks to you, that we would not let the devil whisper those doubts and uncertainties into our ears, but that we would ignore him put the devil back into his place and return to you to receive all of the good things, the grace, the forgiveness, the love that flows out from your kingdom to us in Jesus. We pray these things in his name. Amen.